Oh, uh, sure, Cameron, you can do that. And meanwhile, people can keep on joining. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to session two. Um, Cameron, again, great to be with you this afternoon. Uh, we have a really packed agenda today, so uh, I'm going to move quite fast. But as with yesterday, please, if you have questions, don't hesitate to drop them into the chat. Uh, or I'll try and pause at the end of each major section for, for verbal questions as well. Um, today's topics are quite dense in terms of Cernicube from a developer's perspective. We're going to look at the Cernicube scanners. There are different types for different purposes, some key metrics, some best practices around rules, quality profiles, and quality gates. We spoke yesterday about the principles of clean as you code. Today, I want to look at the practical aspects of it. Um, the types of ways that you can configure the new code period. Um, and then we'll dive into the detail of how that's done on the platform tomorrow with the, uh, with the administration team. We're going to look at branches and pull requests, how issues work, uh, which I hinted at yesterday, uh, a little bit of more of a deep dive into security and touching on Sonar Lint and connected mode. Um, at the end with some time, hopefully for questions. Again, we'll take a five to 10 minute break in the middle and uh, should take about uh, two and a half hours today. So let's get right into it. Uh, I want to give you a bit of a background of the different types of scanners for different projects in Sonicube. Um, scanning at a basic level is quite simple. Um, there are some, some complexities when we start talking about things like generated code and third party libraries that I want to address as well to give you a sense of what you can do with Sonicube. But let's start with the basic principles of how the scanners work. So generally when you set up an enterprise installation of Sonicube, you have your Sonicube host and your database host uh, somewhere in the organization, whether it's on premises or, or in your private cloud. And then in your case, you have Jenkins hosts that are running your CI builds. And this is where the Cernicube scanners run. They run on exactly the same place as all of your builds. And that is, Cernicube is designed to be integrated into your CI system so that where you build is also where you scan. Um, if you've been using Sonicube Community Edition or in some smaller projects, then maybe you've been scanning locally on your own workstation. Um, as you scale up to Sonicube Enterprise, that's really not best practice. It, it ends up being slightly random and it can overwrite results of other developers in your team. So generally at, at an enterprise level installation of Sonicube, you delegate all of the scanning to your CI CD platform in your case, Jenkins, and I'll show you how that uh, works with some examples a little later today. So I want to go through the workflow of what the scanners do and how they work, just to give you a sense of what goes on when Jenkins kicks off a scan. The first thing that the scanner does is logs into the Sonicube server to download some information about the project. Uh, project key, branch name, uh, the, the quality profiles, which rules are being applied. Uh, so that it can use that information during the scan. Then the scanner parses and analyzes all of the source files that are confined in the source tree. So generally the first step in, uh, in what you do is a checkout. You check out the branch that you're interested in, and then the scanner takes care of doing a recursive pass through the source tree and analyzing every file that it can find. That analysis is then bundled up into a report. It's basically a zip file and sent back to the Sonicube server. And at this point, the analyzer's job is done. The scanner's job is done. Um, so you'll see a success message at the bottom of the, the scanning logs and the scanner's job is finished. The story isn't quite over though. There's a small amount of post-processing that happens on the Sonicube server. In particular, in particular, calculation of the quality gate happens on the server side and any pull request decoration, which we'll see a little later today, um, is done from the Sonicube server out into your DevOps platform, out into Bitbucket, rather than from the scanner. So that final piece of post processing on the Sonicube side is actually quite important. So that's the basic workflow. Uh, and now I want to address the different types of scanners because there are uh, a few for different purposes. Um, oh, and we should have started with the easy one. Let's just see. 
uh, things have been reordered here. Um, let me just start uh, with, uh, let's take it in the order we had it. Let's start with Java. Um, when you uh, scan Java projects, um, we have plugins for both Maven and Gradle. Uh, to make it easy to scan so, uh, with Cernicube using the same tool that you use for your builds. Um, so if you're building with Maven, there's a Maven plugin that provides you with a new target, similarly for Gradle. The reason that we want to do this and make it easy to scan using your build tool is that Java analysis requires some compile time artifacts. We actually use the jar files to do some deeper analysis of your code, things like type analysis. And so when, um, when you're building with Maven and Gradle, the build tools know exactly where those jar files are stored. So they can pass that information directly to the scanner without you having to intervene with kind of clumsy command line um, uh, parameters telling Sonicube scanner where the, where the jar files are. So, Generally, if you're building with Maven or Gradle, it's the by far the easiest thing to scan your Sonicube, uh, scan your projects with Sonicube using Maven and Gradle. So in Maven, it's a simple Sona Sona target, and in Gradle, it's uh, a Sonicube target. And so the basic steps you take when you're uh, building and analyzing a project, you build it, you run your unit tests to generate coverage information, and then you run the Sonicube scan. In the .NET world, things are slightly different. And the reason for this is that we hook into the Roslyn compiler. So the, the, Roslyn, the Microsoft Roslyn compiler is quite a sophisticated piece of equipment. It allows you as a static code analyzer to register yourself with the compiler. And in that way, you get all of the parsing and lexing for free. You don't need to build your own parser and lexer. Um, you get all of that information from the compiler, plus a whole bunch of other useful stuff. And basically what you need to write then in your static code analyzer is, is just the rules. So we take advantage of that in our .NET analyzer. That means that you need to use a special scanner. And each time you want to scan your project, you must build it because Sonicube collects all of the information from the compiler in order to do some of the analysis. So scanning .NET projects is a more complicated process than scanning, uh, for example, Java or uh, uh, JavaScript. And it, it turns into basically a three-step process. The way it looks, depending on whether you're using um, classic .NET or .NET Core, um, the, the steps are the same, the tools are slightly different. You run a begin step using this, the scanner for MS build. This registers the Sonicube analyzer with the, um, uh, with the Microsoft Roslyn compiler and also downloads some basic information from the Sonicube server. You then run a full build using MS build and this gathers up all of the analysis information then you run an end step and this packages everything up and pushes it all back to the Sonic Cube server. So it's a slightly more complex process than I mentioned in the flow diagram earlier, um, basically because we need to integrate with the Roslyn compiler. And you can do this either on Windows machines with classic.net or on essentially any machine uh, with .NET Core tools. Um, I will send through all of these slides later so that you can check the uh, parameter list in the documentation. Um, there's a, a full set of parameters that you can apply to your scans that are available uh, on our, in our documentation. And for basically everything else, there's a third scanner, which is the command line interface. It's essentially a Java utility and it's invoked by your DevOps platform directly. And it's used for all languages where Sonicube doesn't need compile time artifacts. So languages like uh, JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, all of the infrastructure as code, uh, scanners run under the CLI scanner, uh, COBOL, PL1, the old mainframe languages, um, pretty much everything except uh, Java and .NET. I'll talk about Objective-C, which I know you use in a second. 
There are a couple of ways to configure the command line scanner. The easiest way so that you could have the configuration version controlled is to use a Sona project.properties file that sits in the root of your project uh, and provides any special configuration that the SonaCube CLI scanner needs. Or you can override that using command line options. So standard uh, Java minus capital D command line options are available. Um, and you simply provide option equals value. I want to talk briefly about the C family of languages because I know you have some Objective C. Uh, I'm not so sure about C and C++, but Objective C falls into um, a, a family of languages that are complicated to write uh, static code analyzers for. Um, the C family of languages have some constructs within the language that make it particularly difficult to analyze statically using a, a code analyzer. So think about, for example, uh, fun, uh, language implementations like macros and conditional compilation. Unless you know what's going on, on under the hood, and unless you have a full expansion of the macros, for example, or you know which code is being compiled at the time, um, it's impossible to correctly analyze a piece of C, C++ or Objective-C. So to compensate for this, you, you basically have two choices when you write a static code analyzer for these languages. You can write your own compiler, or you can ask the existing compilers to do some of your work for you. We've chosen the second path. And so we have a tool called the build wrapper. And the idea is that this transparently wraps your build, the build of your Objective C project, and gathers some information from the compiler. It basically eavesdrops on the compilation and pushes all of that information into an output directory, essentially a big JSON file. Then you pass to the SonicCube scanner that JSON file, and it takes all of that information from the compiler and uses it during the analysis of your Objective-C code. So um, analysis of, of Objective-C becomes a two-step process. And again, each time in the same way as for C-sharp, you need to run a full build every time you want to analyze. Um, there is some caching built into uh, the SonaCube uh, analyzer for uh, C, C++ and Objective-C, so you can take advantage of that, but you still need to do a full build of your project to be able to analyze it correctly with the SonaCube scanner. Um, not so much for Objective-C, but certainly for C and C++, some uh, build commands have problems being wrapped, and so in that case, uh, and I'm thinking particularly about uh, the Android build system, um, you can ask the build system to generate a compilation database, um, which is used instead of the build wrapper output. So you have a choice of one or the other. Um, in each case, you need to build the code. Any questions about the three types, or well, four if you count Maven and Gradle as separate, um, the four types of uh, scanner. No? Uh, have, we, uh, yes. have we covered any JS, JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, any, any other card? Good, good question. Um, JavaScript and TypeScript are covered by the plane scanner. Uh, and in fact, I have a JavaScript example a little later that I'm scanning under Jenkins. And you'll see all you need to do is invoke Sona scanner at the root of your JavaScript project, and it will recursively pass through the, uh, the project source files and analyze all the JavaScript and TypeScript that it comes across. Okay. I mentioned um, yesterday in the overview section, the key feature section, that we put a lot of work at Sonosource into integrating to the platforms that sit around us. Um, that goes for scanners as well. Uh, so we don't just provide the scanners themselves, we also provide some support for different types of pipelines. So GitHub Actions, Bitbucket Cloud Pipelines, 
um, GitLab, Azure DevOps, and particularly important in your case is that there's a special Jenkins plugin um, that allows you to centrally configure your Sonicube instance or instances if you're using a test server um, and set up some tools that make it easier to build Sonicube into Jenkins. So I'm going to go through uh, some examples of those and show you how Sonicube integrates into Jenkins pipelines, in particular um, scripted pipelines. Um, there are a couple of aspects to the Jenkins plugin. Once you've installed it in your Jenkins instance, uh, you have the ability under global tool configuration to add things like the Sonicube scanners. So our plugin knows how to install the CLI scanner and the MS build scanner. And at the configure system menu of Jenkins, you then get to add your Sonicube servers. So if you have multiples, for example, a production server and a test server, you can add both of them. And the names of these then become available to you in your Jenkins pipelines. Uh, so you essentially install or configure um, your uh, Sonicube servers and they, they then become available uh, for anyone using pipelines. For example, if you're using Maven, um, here's a, a basic pipeline example um, that allows you to check out, build, and analyze a, a Maven project using Sonicube. Um, you can see it's fairly straightforward. Um, there's an SCM step to check out your, your main branch, um, the build step, which is your normal uh, Maven clean verify, uh, with some additional steps to make sure that you're gathering Jococo information. And then the key final two steps are here. So the Sonicube analysis is essentially running the Maven target that we saw earlier, Sona Sona, in, while making sure that you know where your Sonicube server is. So you use this with Sonicube environment uh, construct to provide the uh, URL and credentials for your Sonicube server to the Maven command. And then optionally, there's a final quality gate um, step where you can have the status of your quality gate, whether it's passed or failed, pulled back into Jenkins. This operates using a webhook mechanism from Sonicube. So there's some configuration needed on the Sonicube side as well. Uh, so it's quite a lightweight um, mechanism for having your quality gate status for the branch pulled back into Jenkins. And you can then decide whether you want to fail the pipeline or not. Um, failing pipelines is a slightly um, uh, contentious topic. Uh, for a long time, we resisted it at Sonosource um, because generally there was so much happening downstream of the Sonicube scan in the pipeline that um, it didn't make sense to fail based on the Sonicube quality gate. Um, but it is also a very good way of getting the attention of development teams. So if, you're, if your pipeline fails, you want to do something about it. Um, and so there's always an option in, in all of our integrations now to be able to fail the pipeline if the quality gate is red. I'm going to talk a little later today about branches and pull requests and give you a, a quick demo. Um, one of the challenges of analyzing branches and pull requests in the past was that you needed to create some conditional logic in your pipelines. So if you were on a branch, you needed to pass some branch parameters to Sonicube. If you were analyzing a, a pull request, um, you needed to pass some pull request parameters to Sonicube in order to have the pull request analyzed correctly. Um, what we've done over the last six, 12 months or so um, is simplify uh, the pipelines where we can do auto detection of the branch and pull request parameters. So if you're in GitHub, GitLab, Azure DevOps, or Bitbucket, um, that happens automatically. If you're using the multi-branch plugin in Jenkins, and I'll show you the Bitbucket multi-branch plugin in a, in a moment, um, what happens behind the scenes is that the multi-branch plugin detects what's going on, whether you're on a branch or a merge request. 
sets some environment variables, and then the Sonicube scanner pulls that information from the environment variables. So you don't need to set up any conditional logic inside your, um, your pipelines. You can have very, very simple pipelines um, and still take advantage of pull request and branch analysis. Uh, and I've mentioned failing pipelines as well. So um, there's a webhook mechanism in Jenkins. If you're using other um, uh, other mechanisms, there's a command and line parameter to the scanner, uh, which uh, polls the Sonicube server until it knows the final status of the quality gate for the project. All right. Um, any questions about Jenkins? Because I want to show you a quick example of my uh bitbucket server um project uh, which is being analyzed using a jenkins file but before i do any general questions yes uh any uh, uh, upcoming roadmap to support uh, L, uh gcp uh deep tools uh google code um I can't yeah. remember what the P stands for. Yes, uh, um, Google Cloud Platform. Yeah. In terms of running scans there, or? Um, like you're supporting that uh, Azure, right? Azure DevOps pipeline you are supporting. Yes. Similarly, any plan from the Sonar Cube to support that for AWS and Google, GCP, Google Cloud Platform? Not at this stage. Um, we're monitoring how those platforms evolve, um, but there's no special integration at this stage. Okay, thanks. No problem. Anyone else? Uh, one question, like uh, on Jenkins machine, what we need to you know, install to, to run this uh, particular commands like you've shown, Sonar, so in your in your main Jenkins instance, you need to install the Sonicube plugin um, and provide uh, whichever scanners you need. So the CLI scanner or the MS build scanner. Um, and basically that's it. Jenkins will then download everything it needs. Oh, you need to configure your Sonicube server as well. Then Jenkins will download everything it needs in order to run the builds. Okay. Uh, you're going to elaborate all these sonar options, right? I'm not. I'm not going to elaborate every option because there are lots of them. Okay. Um, but, but our documentation has uh, basically every command line parameter that you can uh, pass to Sony Cube is documented. Okay, you are sharing that, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Let me um, give you a quick bit of insight into a, a quite simple, it's a small JavaScript project, but it'll show you the principles of integrating into Jenkins. So I have my own uh, self-hosted Jenkins here, and I've configured a multi-branch pipeline for Bitbucket. Um, if you take a look at how the, oops, how the pipeline is configured, uh, I basically discover all branches, um, discover my pull requests, and I'm scanning using a Jenkins file. But of course, you can scan using uh, a pipeline here as well. The nice thing about using the multi-branch pipeline is that all of the work for scanning branches and pull requests is done for you. So the pipeline itself becomes really, really simple. Um, and let me show you exactly how simple it is. I have it here in uh, VS Code. It's basically, if you strip out all of the configuration, it's basically one line. Uh, so for a JavaScript project, all I need to do is in the root of the project, run the Sonicube scanner. I do need to tell Sonicube where node is because uh, node is used during our analysis. Um, but apart from that, it's essentially one line of script. Um, and what happens in the background is that the, uh, the Jenkins plugin and the multi-branch pipeline plugin provide all of the information about br branches and pull requests if I'm analyzing them. A couple of other things to notice, um, you'll see here I've got my Sonicube environment. So 
at this point, the, um, the Sonicube plugin passes to the scanner the location of my Sonicube server, uh, any credentials I've uh, created to log into the Sonicube server to represent uh, Jenkins. Um, and that's more or less all I need. Um, I have a bit of special magic here to make sure I'm running under Java 11, um, but the rest of it is really um, quite straightforward. So when you're using the multi-branch plugin with Bitbucket, um, scanning your projects, uh, particularly anything that's non-Java related, becomes super, super simple. And what happens in the background then is that uh, if I take a look, for example, at my pull requests, um, you can see I've got this most recent pull request here that I analyzed before we started today. Um, this has been analyzed using uh, this pipeline and um, essentially all of the information that Sonicube needs is passed to the scanner. Um, the scan takes a couple of minutes and it's pushed back into my Sonicube server. Over in the server, you can see I've got the pull request scan here. I'll come back to this example a little later uh, and show you uh, the pull request, what I did and um, why this pull request quality gate is red. Um, but for now, the principle is that scanning with Jenkins is really, really straightforward. Um, scanning Maven and Gradle projects is only a tiny bit more complicated. Um, you can see from the script example I gave earlier that it's um, uh, it doesn't take much more than a couple of extra steps added to your Jenkins pipelines. Okay, the next topic I want to talk about, I kind of hinted at, at the start of this section, um, which is that basic scans are really straightforward, um, but making sure that you're scanning the right code can be a little tricky. In particular, there, uh, any substantially sized project uh, in modern software development is going to use some third-party source code whether it's internal libraries or, or external, generally you will have some help. You're not writing everything from scratch. And occasionally, um, maybe less than five than we had five years ago, but it's still reasonably popular, you have generated code. Um, so if you're generating, I don't know, templated database access um, mechanisms or something, um, maybe you have a code generator that's creating some of the code for your project. Now, Generator and third-party source code provide some challenges when you're using them with a code analysis tool like Sonicube. In particular, neither, neither of them is usually directly under your control. So code generators, obviously, unless you've got the source code of the generator, you can't change what it's generating. Um, but third-party libraries, uh, if you wanted to make a change based on the information that Sonicube was giving you, you would have to go to the maintainer of that library and say, hey, we found this bug or this vulnerability. Um, we'd really like you to change it, please, and we'll take the new version when it comes out. So it becomes quite a laborious process to make any change to that code. Also, and this particularly holds true for generated code, usually it's not written in the way that you would write your own source code. And that often leads to that, this code violating many, many, many Sonicube rules and generating hundreds or even thousands of issues that basically uh, pollute your project and stop you accessing the issues that are in your own custom code. So as a general rule, um, we suggest not scanning this code or maybe scanning it once in a separate project and then excluding it from your main analysis so that you're focusing just on your own learning made custom code. So that begs the obvious question of, hey, how do I do that? How do I exclude this code from my analysis? And Sonicube has a couple of mechanisms. There is a general exclusion mechanism for excluding files or directories from the analysis. It's called Sona.exclusions and it's configured either inside the Sonicube platform itself or in your Sona project or properties file. Um, you might also have some test code that you want to exclude. Um, there's a, an equivalent Sona.test.exclusions. 
Or if you're in a case where maybe your code is 90% somebody else's and only 10% yours, you can actually have the inverse as well. You can tell SonaCube, please only scan the code that's in sona.inclusions um, and ignore everything else. So these are really useful mechanisms for making sure that you're focusing on the code that's really important, which is the code that your team is writing. Um, it has the nice side effect of not chewing up license uh, lines of code on your platform, um, but really the, the reason it's here is to make sure that the focus of the team is on the code that the team is writing. And so I just want to point out quickly where this lives inside the SonaCube user interface so that um, at the project level, when you want to configure this, you can go to the easiest place. Uh, let me take my example here. Under project settings and general settings, you'll need a project administrator to do this. You'll find a section called analysis scope. And this is all about narrowing the scope of what's, what SonaCube is analyzing. The first section here is called file exclusions. And the first uh, pattern is Sona.exclusions. So this is the place to go if you need to exclude some third party code from your analysis. And it's a fairly simple pattern matching uh, mechanism. A single asterisk matches zero or more characters, a double asterisk matches zero or more directories, and a question mark matches a single character. So if I have, for example, all of my source code gathered in a directory called uh, 3PP, third party code, uh, underneath my source tree, uh, it would be fairly straightforward to say, okay, SonyCube, please ignore all directories and files underneath this 3PP um, uh, directory and just exclude it from the analysis. Don't analyze the code, don't count it, don't do anything. Um, the rest of the code is what is important. Alternatively, if you wanted to uh, go the other direction, you could say only look at the code that's in source learning mate um, and sona.inclusions will then only scan the code that it finds in those, uh, those directories. And you can add as many of these as you like, they're cumulative. Any questions about that? Hey, hi, Camille. A question from me is, uh, so if there are some automated builds that we have and those get triggered, uh, say on a daily basis, followed by an automation suit that executes, uh, which is into a silo, like uh, people do not have to intervene into it. Uh, my question basically is, uh, there are two parts to the question is, one basically is, uh, what is the overhead of running the, the sonar cube on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, can we plan it out? Like if we can execute it on a Friday or a Monday kind of like, can we have it timely uh, executed mm -hmm. without doing anything extra? Uh, and the second part is if there are some uh, the core features of the, of the, uh, of the solution. Uh, can we have only that uh, being addressed within the solar cube on a daily basis and the other on a, uh, on a Friday or a, on a designated day? Um, good question. Uh, let, me, let me take that one piece at a time. Sure. Um, the overhead of the solar cube scan varies depending on a couple of things. Size of the project, obviously, the more code to scan, the, the longer it takes. Um, but also to some extent code complexity, and I'm not talking um, uh, uh, cognitive complexity, but more how your code is, is kind of intertwined. The rule of thumb that you can rely on, um, well, the, the rule of thumb you should, you should try and use is that generally it should be the same order of magnitude as compiling the code. If you think about a Java project, um, compilation time is say 15 minutes then you should assume that the Sony Cube scanning time should be um, around the same order of magnitude. So generally what I recommend to, to answer the question that was kind of implied in there is that for the main branch of your project, you should try and scan once a day 
Uh, I spoke about this yesterday in the, the kind of shifting left slide. Um, so that the feedback loop for your development teams on the main branch is no more than 24 hours. And if your projects are reasonably sized then the overhead of an overnight scan at the same time as you're doing your build is not really very much. To the question of core features and extended features, um, yes, by using this exclusion mechanism, uh, you could set up two different builds for your project so that core features are only scanned once a day. And then on Friday night, you run a separate uh, pipeline that scans the entire code base. Again, unless you have an enormously monolithic project, um, it's probably not worth the overhead of doing that. You're, you're best to scan the whole project every time you, um, uh, uh, every day, but I'm not quite sure how your project is structured. So that might be prohibitive. Okay, yeah. Sounds good, yeah. Um, and the other thing that I'll come to a little later in today's session is talking about um, pull request scans, where it's super useful to, to scan each time. Um, although that does have its own overhead, but we can talk about that a little later. Sure, sure. Thanks, thanks a lot, Cameron. No problem. Okay, let's keep moving. Um, we have quite a lot of ground to cover, so I want to make sure that I uh, move through the next section fairly quickly. I want to talk about some of the key metrics that Sony Cube um, generates. Just to give you a sense of what goes on when you scan a project with Sony Cube, every time Sony Cube uh, runs on a branch, we calculate about 40 or 50 metrics. So there are metrics around coverage, code duplication, uh, size, complexity, um, all useful, but only a few of them are really important. And we pull those up to the top level overview page of a project. And they're there to give you a sense of the overall health of your code and your project. And there's some semantics that sit behind this that I want to give you now um, so that you can uh, easily understand what's going on inside your projects. Um, so at the top level of a project, we pull up um, four key numbers, the number of bugs, vulnerabilities, hotspots, and code smells. We do it twice for new code and for overall code. And each of those numbers has an associated rating from A to E. So there's a reliability rating for bugs, a security rating for vulnerabilities, a security review rating for hotspots, and a maintainability rating that relates to code smells or maintainability issues. Now, um, obviously, you can see from the color scheme here that A is good and E is bad, um, but there is actually some semantics that sit behind this that will help you understand um, uh, some of the emergencies that you might have inside your, your uh, code base. So I want to go through those semantics now so you can get a sense of what's going on. And the first uh, two ratings to talk about are security, so relating to vulnerabilities, and reliability relating to bugs. And e this rating represents the single most severe bug or vulnerability in the associated code period. So if you have one blocker bug in your code, your reliability rating will be E. If you have no blockers, but one or more criticals, it will be D. No blockers, no criticals, but one or more majors, it will be C and so on down through B and A. And as I said, these are calculated for both the new code and the overall code. And of course they can be different. And this has a couple of side effects on the, the way this is calculated. The, the first is that it really operates as a kind of a warning sign for the team. So you can be happily coding along, uh, your rating is at an A or a B, one developer introduces one blocker bug, your reliability rating on the next scan will immediately jump from A to E. And it's like a big red warning sign for the team saying, hey, look over here, we have a blocker, someone needs to do something about this. You fix that blocker bug, the next scan, the rating drops back down to where it was at, at A or B. So it's like a big red warning light and it can change very rapidly. So just be aware that um, this is a kind of a sign for the team to take a look at what's going on with particular bugs or vulnerabilities in the project. 
The maintainability rating is calculated quite differently. And this has to do with uh, technical debt. It's, it's a kind of a density metric for technical debt in your code. Um, I mentioned briefly when we spoke about rules yesterday, that for each rule at Sonosource that we provide, we calculate or estimate um, the remediation cost. So how long would it take a developer generally to fix one incident of this rule, one occurrence of um, an issue? And if you sum the total remediation effort for all of the code smell issues in a project, that number is considered to be the technical debt of the project. So you'll see in the project homepage, technical debt is aligned. It's on the same line on the homepage as the number of code smells. That's because it's directly related. The amount of effort in your technical debt is the amount to fix all of the code smells. And we calculate that on each um, scan of a branch. We also calculate a second number, which is the technical debt divided by the effort to entirely rewrite the code base. It's called the technical debt ratio. Um, the denominator of this is calculated by multiplying the number of lines of code by 30 minutes per line. Now, that seems like a really large number, uh, but it's intended to take into account the whole development life cycle of a line of code um, from uh, requirements all the way through to creating unit tests and code review and, and all of the other bits and pieces that come with writing a line of code. So to give you a quick worked example, let's imagine you have a project with uh, 1,120 minutes of technical debt and 1,500 lines of code. So your total rewrite effort becomes 45,000 minutes and your technical debt ratio is then 1120 divided by 45,000, uh, which is effectively the technical debt density within your code of two and a half percent. How does this relate to the maintainability rating? I hear you ask. Um, we calculate the maintainability rating by putting the technical debt ratio into a table. So if you have between zero and 5% technical debt, your maintainability rating will be A. 5 to 10 is B, 10 to 20 is C, 20 to 50 is D. And if you need to use more than half the time it would take to rewrite the code to fix all of your technical debt, then your maintainability rating is E. Now, the reason that this exists in the quality gate, and I'll, I'll touch on this again um, when we talk about quality gates, this is part of the standard quality gate, um, the maintainability rating. And the reason we use this rather than saying no code smells at all is to give you a little bit of flexibility around maintainability issues. It's almost impossible to write a new pull request um, or a new feature without incurring a small amount of technical debt. So using this buffer of zero to 5% um, gives you a little bit of flexibility uh, to add a bit of technical debt, think about fixing it later, but without necessarily having the quality gate turn red right away as soon as you add the very first code smell. Um, so in our case here, our technical debt ratio is two and a half percent, so our maintainability rating would be A. Um, there are a couple of side effects to how this is calculated. Um, the first is that it doesn't move anywhere near as quickly as the other two that we just talked about, um, because it's based on overall lines of code and overall technical debt, um, so it moves quite slowly. It also tends to favor large pro or be favorable to large projects. So as your line of code count goes up, um, this denominator becomes very large very quickly. And so you'll find that larger projects tend to sit in the A and B region. It doesn't mean they don't have technical debt. It just means that compared to the overall size, it's relatively small. And the corollary to that, of course, is if you have a large project with uh, a maintainability rating of D or E, you have a lot of technical debt. So those are the three um, issue related uh, ratings. The final one relates to uh, security hotspots and it's more to do with process than with the code itself. So the security review rating basically says how many of the hotspots in my code period have I reviewed? Um, and it's a fairly simple stepped percentage 
um, up to 80% and above being an A rating for review of security hotspots. So all of these four ratings are available to use in the quality gates and we'll come back to an example of how they're used uh, a little later in today's session. I wanted to touch briefly on portfolios um, because these four ratings we've just talked about are also available in portfolios, uh, along with a fifth that doesn't appear in uh, projects. They have a slightly different meaning though. Um, the, well, they have the same meaning, but a slightly different way of calculation. The reliability, vulnerability, review and maintainability ratings in a portfolio are calculated as the average of all of the underlying projects in an unweighted base and using the leaf nodes of your portfolio tree. So um, the reason we do this is to make sure that portfolio ratings are not unbalanced. Um, so to, to give you an example, if I was to calculate this reliability rating in the same way as I do for projects, um, it would immediately be E because we have one project here, or sorry, three projects here in E. But if this portfolio contains 100 projects, an E rating for the entire portfolio is not really a useful or fair representation of what's going on in the underlying projects. Um, so for that reason, we average all of these. And portfolios introduce a fifth rating, which is for releasability. And this stands in at the portfolio level for the quality gate. And it basically says, tell me the percentage of projects that have passed their quality gate in my portfolio. Um, so you can see here, we have three uh, projects that have failed their, port, uh, their quality gate. Um, that represents less than 20% of the overall project in this portfolio. So my releasability rating is still A. Um, you can see here we provide a direct link to get to the failed project if you need to, um, so that you can drill down to projects in trouble. Uh, we do the same with the other ratings. There are direct links to the, the worst in each, um, in each rating. Um, but don't be surprised when you don't see quality gates in portfolios. The releasability rating stands in for them as a measure of how many projects in your portfolio have passed their gate. Okay, finally, in discussing um, metrics, uh, there was a question yesterday about complexity. And it's a, a really interesting topic in software development. Overly complex code, of course, starts to become difficult to maintain. And so Sonicube measures a couple of complexity metrics that I'll um, talk through in a second. There was a question, though, about what happens when we start to try and refactor um, for complexity. And one of the, one of the weaknesses of um, having complexity calculated in a tool like Sonicube is that um, we actually sum up the complexity to the project level. Now that doesn't actually help you very much as a development team. It's not very useful. You can see in the screen grab up here, it's not very useful to know that the cyclomatic complexity of my entire project is 3,996. I can't do very much about that. Um, what is useful though, is to know that um, the complexity of a particular method or a particular file has gone over a threshold. So in fact, there are rules in all languages um, that are configurable. So you can configure a threshold to say, hey, trigger an issue on this file if the complexity for the file goes over a certain threshold. Um, this is much more useful than uh, knowing the overall metric itself. So if your teams are concerned about complexity, I'd really recommend taking a look at those rules and working out for particular languages um, and maybe even for particular projects um, where you think the threshold should be and then add those rules to your quality profile, um, adjust the threshold and see what turns up in the issue results rather than in the metric results. What I will point out though, is that, and let me grab a better example. Uh, this one will do. Um, the complexity metrics are actually, uh, they, they have drilled down. So if you want to find particular files that are overly complex and start to refactor them, 
you can do that by drilling down through the code tree in Cernicube. So let's take a look here. Um, I'll go down into the main source code here. Um, these are then unfortunately not sorted by complexity, but you can um, you can find the overall cyclomatic complexity of a particular file. Um, and so for example, I might want to take a look here at checkutils.java um, and see whether I want to do some refactoring of um, this, uh, this file to reduce the overall complexity. Um, I've forgotten who asked the question about complexity yesterday, but does that help answer your question? No response. Okay. Um, I want to quickly mention um, the two types of complexity rules that we have uh, while we're here talking about complexity. Um, the classic measure of complexity is called cyclomatic complexity. Um, in a sense, it's actually slightly badly named. What it is, is a testability metric. So how many test cases do I need to write to fully test a particular piece of code? Um, and this can be a little misleading. So the two pieces of code that I have here, um, the switch statement and the horrible set of if statements have exactly the same cyclomatic complexity and in fact do exactly the same thing. Um, the code on the left is an awful lot more uh, readable and understandable and maintainable than the code on the right, even though they do the same thing. Yet, if you were to look at these from a complexity perspective, you'd, you'd calculate exactly the same number using classic McCabe cyclomatic complexity. Um, so we invented several years ago our own complexity metric, which is more about code understandability. Uh, so the cognitive complexity metric is also calculated by Sonicube on every file. And you can see here, it gives a much nicer indication of the actual understandability of these two pieces of code. So the code on the left has a cognitive complexity of two and the code on the right has a cognitive complexity of 27. Um, so whichever of those two metrics you need to use, um, they're both calculated for you uh, at each, uh, for each file within a, a solution. Okay, it's just coming up to uh, 10 o'clock Europe time, so 2.30 India time. What I'm gonna suggest is let's take uh, about a 10 minute break um, because the next two sections work quite nicely together. We're going to talk about rules and we're gonna talk about quality gates, uh, sorry, quality profiles and quality gates. And this is all about best practices for managing your quality governance within the organization. So I'd like to join them together. So let's take uh, a break and come back at, uh, so it will be, 10 10 europe time uh 2 40 uh india time uh, and i'll pause the recording and we can pick it up then okay welcome back everybody um the next two sections are all about quality profiles and quality gates and the reason that we treat these carefully and and go through some principles here is that these are really the two fundamental um, customization points you have in your Sony Cube uh, installation. There's minor customization around projects and scanning and, and exclusions that we covered earlier. Um, but the big choices you make are, which rules do I apply to my projects? And how do I structure my quality gates uh, to provide a minimum code standard for the organization? And so I wanna go through a couple of principles and give you a couple of examples from our own usage at Sonosource of how you can structure your quality profiles and gates. Um, let's start with profiles. And really the best practice here is to have as few quality profiles as you can get away with. Um, ideally one per language, but in a large organization that's generally not possible. But in that case, as few as, um, as few as you possibly can. And this is really to ensure that you've got some consistency and a baseline across the organization. So um, 
you can imagine in a free-for-all situation where every team can create their own quality profile, you have some teams that uh, load theirs up with hundreds of rules and other teams that cut them down to maybe 20 or 30 rules. You then have no comparability uh, of the code quality and security between those two teams because they're applying completely different sets of rules. So generally you want to have only a few quality profiles and one which is set as the organizational baseline below which no one is allowed to drop. If teams then want to add some rules to that baseline, uh, you can use the, the inheritance mechanism in quality profiles that I'll discuss with the admin team tomorrow to basically create a kind of a tiered structure of profiles inheriting from that organizational baseline. Um, and the third point here is if you're using the latest version of Sonicube, if you're tracking each release as we bring them out, um, you have the option to revisit that quality profile on a periodic basis as we introduce new rules for each language. So generally you will want to add new rules that we provide, um, but maybe you want to test them out on a test system first, um, but you should introduce a kind of an internal process around revisiting quality profiles. Um, as an example of this second uh, point here, the second best practice, I want to give you a look at the quality profiles that we use at Sonosource, um, particularly for Java. Uh, a lot of our code is written in Java and we have quite a nicely structured set of Java quality profiles. Um, starting here, for each language that we write an analyzer for at Sonosource, we provide a Sonaway built-in quality profile. And the idea is it's a kind of a sensible baseline of rules for that language. It's all of the non-controversial stuff that I as a Java developer would expect to be held accountable for. So in Java, for example, it's 490 rules. It's about two thirds of the total number of rules that we have. So anything that's edgy or anything that's a little bit controversial, um, we generally leave out of the Sona way and it's, it's for you and your teams to decide to put that back in. And what we've done at Sona Source is we've said, okay, we're going to build on the Sona way, um, but our default quality profile for any project that doesn't choose another one is going to be this default Sona Source conventions that adds another 52 rules for Java on top of the 490 that are part of the Sona way. And you can see that some projects have even taken this further and added additional rules for the project specifically. So the Sonicube development team that develops the core platform has added another 23 rules on top of the Sonicube, uh, Sonosource default. Um, the language plugins are using the default. Uh, the Java bubble has added an, a bunch of rules on top of the language plugins. So you can develop quite a nice um, structure to how your uh, rule sets are based for teams that want to go further with Sonicube or need some specific rules without allowing teams to drop below your default um, uh, organizational baseline. And this is really um, a best practice in structuring quality profiles. You have a couple of options when you're managing profiles. Uh, you can inherit from uh, your baseline, uh, which is what I was just showing. If you need to create an independent standalone quality profile, but you don't want to do it from zero, uh, you can copy, you can create a copy of a profile um, that removes the inheritance and that second profile can then um, evolve independently of the first. Uh, there's a compare function so that you can measure how far your uh, inherited or your copied profiles have drifted from the organizational baseline. Quality gates, um, you're going to be unsurprised that the principles for managing quality gates are very similar to the principles for managing um, quality profiles. Really creating one or at most a few quality gates across the organization is the best practice here for exactly the same reasons as for quality profiles. Um, the quality gate is, is your organizational standard for code that gets released to the field. 
if you're insisting that your quality gates must be green for code to progress through, through your pipelines, then this is a really fundamental decision about the code quality that you expect from your teams at LearningMate. So generally you want that to be um, controlled. So it's normal, the quality gates are normally centrally controlled rather than allowing teams to define their own. And you will normally have one or maybe a couple. For example, if you don't have, if you have languages without coverage, you might create a second non-coverage quality gate. Um, but generally a very small number of quality gates because this is a fundamental part of your, um, your, your quality governance inside the organization. To align with the clean as you code paradigm, you will generally try and use metrics on new code. Um, so for example, uh, the A reliability rating and A security rating, which effectively translate to no new bugs and no new vulnerabilities, 100% review of hotspots. Um, if you want to start a little uh, less strict than this, you can. Um, if you do that, you then want to revisit these quality gates and tighten those criteria progressively over time. So if you want to ease teams into using Sonicube without terrifying them with, with uh, red quality gates everywhere, you might want to start with a slightly easier quality gate. Um, and then in three months time, when everyone's gotten used to it, um, tighten the criteria a little, and then maybe three months after that, tighten them again. I've also seen teams that have a stepped series of quality gates from say zero to five. Uh, so when you, you first onboard your project in Sonicube, you start at the easiest one and then teams choose to step up to more complicated quality gates. Um, that can also create a bit of uh, gamification, some, some competition uh, between teams. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that in our own quality gates in a second. Um, generally, the best practice in terms of creating your quality gates is to take the six key metrics that we spoke about earlier. Well, I spoke about four, um, the four ratings here. The other two that are pulled up to the top level of a project are coverage and duplications. And you set thresholds for those within your quality gate based on new code. So you can see here, when you create a quality gate, you have the option of adding either conditions on new code or existing code. Um, the out of the box standard quality gate for Sonicube looks exactly like this. It's entirely based on new code. So this is a really strict implementation of the clean as you code paradigm that we were talking about yesterday. And the question that automatically raises is, hey, well, what about my legacy code? What happens if there is a blocker bug or a blocker vulnerability in the legacy code? That quality gate won't catch it. And that's completely true. So if or when you start to want to concern yourself with the criteria sorry, with the legacy code, the, the overall code, you can start adding some criteria to your quality gates, um, being really careful. So this example here shows two additional uh, criteria on overall code. And so the quality gate will turn red if the reliability rating is worse than a D on overall code, or if the security rating is worse than a D. Now, remembering back to um, the ratings we had earlier, the only thing worse than D is E, and an E in those two ratings means that you have a blocker. So what this quality gate translates to in real life is no blocker bugs anywhere in the code and no blocker vulnerabilities anywhere in the code. And so what it effectively says is, no blockers, uh, or it says a blocker is a blocker. A blocker should stop us from taking this code to production. Um, so no matter whether it's in new code or existing code, we will enforce that by adding these criteria to the quality gate. Uh, and if I take a look at, again, a real life example from us at Sonosource, um, we have a couple of quality gates. Um, our default quality gate is uh, very similar to what you just saw. Let me just extend this window a bit so you can see it. Um, we have the six key metrics for new code and two metrics for existing code. Uh, so exactly what we just saw, no blocker bugs, no blocker vulnerabilities. Um, our requirement internally on code coverage is a little higher than the out of the box quality gate um, at 85%. Everything else is basically the same. 
Now, two down from this, you can see we've started to create a bit of internal competition between our teams. If you want to be part of the Champions League um, for your project at Sonosource, you need to step up to 90% code coverage. Uh, the rest of this quality gate is the same, um, but basically if you want to really up your game on uh, code quality and security and step up your coverage ratings, you can ask to move up to the Champions League quality gate and you'll be assessed at a higher level, uh, particularly for code coverage than the rest of your colleagues. So this, um, uh, you can see quality gates are relatively simple compared to profiles. So there's no mechanism for inheritance or copying. Oh, sorry, there is for copying, but no inheritance mechanism. It's basically intended that you will have only a handful of these and they're fairly simple to create and modify. Any questions on profiles and gates? No? Okay. Yesterday we talked fairly extensively about the principles of clean as you code and making sure that your teams are managing uh, Ah, Luxman, question? Yes. Hi. So, uh, yeah, hi. How can we set up these uh, profiles in uh, .NET plugins in Visual Studio? Is there any way? Sorry, in, in dot, for .NET languages? Yes. Um, good question. And I, I kind of brushed over this by talking specifically about Java. Each language has its own set of quality profiles. Um, so you can see here, they're listed by language. Uh, and in fact, uh, we have a similar situation for C Sharp internally. Um, there is a Sonaway built-in profile. And then our C Sharp team, our .NET team has added a second uh, quality profile, which is our default, which has almost well, over a hundred extra rules in the, um, the, the profile. So profiles are set up per language. And then each project can choose which profile for which language it applies to the project. Does that answer okay. your question? Um, yes. Uh, so how can I use this as plugin in my visual studio? I was asking that. Is there any way? Like, you know, in ReSharper, in Visual Studio, we have ReSharper, right? And it suggests the uh, modifications based on the rules defined in ReSharper. So we have these rules defined in Sonar Cube, right? So do you have any plugins for that? Yes, uh, Sonar Lint, uh, which is essentially a replacement for ReSharper. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And okay. you can align the profile in Sonar Cube with what Sonar Lint applies. Um, so Sonar Lint has a connected mode and in connected mode, when you open a project in Sonar Lint, it will check with Sonar Cube what the quality profile is for that project and then apply those rules inside Visual Studio. Okay. All right, so I'll, I'll try that. Okay. I'll, I'll mention connected mode again at the end of uh, today's session. Uh, oh, it it does nice. a little bit more than this, but this is one of the, the main features. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Okay, um, I spoke about the principle of clean as you code, focusing on new code. Um, what I didn't do yesterday was go into the details of how you can configure this for different um, project styles and different team development styles. Um, one of the principles of clean as you code is that there is a period of time for um, there's a period of time that Sony Cube considers uh, any code within that period to be new code and as a team, you need to decide how you configure that within your project. What I want to do now is explain what the options are 
and um, give you a sense of how you might be able to configure that. The details of the project configuration we'll discuss tomorrow, um, but I'll show you where this sits inside uh, the overall system. So you need to decide as a team what you're going to have as the period of time for new code. Um, because the way SonyCube calculates new code is to look at the blame information for each line. If that line, if the blame information for that line sits inside the code period, um, if the commit date sits inside the new code period, it's considered as new code. If it sits outside the new code period, then it's considered to be overall code. And there are a couple of principles. Your new code period should be long enough that you've got time to fix issues. Um, before they drop out. Because what happens when you start a fresh new code period is that any issues that were part of your new code period now move into overall code and all of the counters are reset. So you need to have enough time in your new code period to be able to fix issues before they drop into that legacy period. But you need your new code period to be short enough that you don't end up with hundreds or thousands of issues, um, because then it just becomes as, as overwhelming as the overall code. And depending on how your projects are structured, generally I see huh, something, huh. yeah, Samantha. Question? Nope. Okay. Um, Generally, what I see is something between two weeks and three months. Um, two weeks is quite short. It's basically for agile teams that are working in two week sprints and that are comfortable that they can fix enough of their issues in that two week sprint before they fall into the legacy period. At the other end, three months is essentially for teams that do uh, quarterly releases. So um, you, you've got a, a steady cadence across the year of releases and you want to fix everything before a particular release goes out. At Sonosource, um, we generally have a new code period of around two months because we release a new version of our product about every two months. And our teams find that that works reasonably well. They, they still work in sprints for feature development, um, but the overall release cycle has a two month new code period uh, on the main branch so that we can uh, fix any issues that accumulate there um, in a kind of a cleanup sprint before we do the main release. So what are the options that you have for creating this new code period? There are four different possibilities and I want to step through them quickly now and then give you a, a kind of a visual version of this which might make it a little clearer. Um, the inbuilt kind of automagic option for, for um, new code periods is previous version. So if you're using, um, as we do, uh, a version-based system, semantic versioning for releasing your uh, product, SonyCube will start a fresh new code period when you add, uh, sorry, when you change the version number that you're passing. This actually has some history. It's derived very much from the Maven um, build system where you provide a version as part of your POM and that version is consistently passed to the SonyCube scanner by the Maven plugin and passed then through to SonyCube. Uh, so you will have seen when I looked at new code in um, one of our internal projects yesterday that we had our new code period as being since 9.3. Uh, so if I have a look at the main SonyCube project, uh, here you can see we're currently working on version 9.4. So our new code period is since 9.3 and we started about a month ago. And in that time, we've accumulated no new bugs, no new vulnerabilities and no new hotspots and about two days of technical debt. Um, if you're using feature branches and you want to analyze your feature branches, um, SonyCube can calculate the branch point and then use that branch point as the starting point for the new code. And so any new code or altered code on that branch is then considered to be part of the new code period for the branch. This is super useful for things like maintenance branches um, and SonyCube will then simply calculate the start point for you. 
the other two options on the right hand side of the slide are really about you creating time periods yourself rather than related to any events inside the project. Uh, so there's a sliding number of days, it's essentially a backwards looking uh, new code period that says, okay, anything for the last n number of days is considered to be new code. Um, generally teams use something like 30 or 60 days. So any code written in the last 30 or 60 days is considered new code. And the fourth option is the inverse of that. It basically says starting from a particular date, any code written after that date is considered to be new code. And to do that, you choose a specific analysis uh, in Sonicube. And that analysis is that the date timestamp of that analysis is considered to be the start point for your new code. Um, presenting that maybe in a more useful or a more visual way, um, let's imagine you have uh, your project going along through particular versions over time. If you choose the previous version mechanism, then every time you change that version string, Sonicube will start a fresh new code period. Um, because that's considered to be a major event in the project lifecycle, and um, you want to start a fresh new code period when you start a new version of the product. The backwards looking number of days, uh, if I take as an example 28, um, and these are weekly uh, dotted lines here, then this moves with you day by day as you, um, as you move through time. There's uh, a consideration to be a little careful of here. If you're using this backwards looking number of days, you need to be really careful uh, about managing your issues because an issue that was created 28 days ago, as soon as you move to the next day, will drop into the overall code period. And if you wanted to fix it, you'll need to go and find it again in the overall code. So be super careful about managing your issues um, your issue backlog in the new code period when you're using this technique. Um, the reference branch technique is fairly obvious. We calculate where the feature branch was taken from the main branch, uh, and that's used as the start of the new code period. And the specific analysis, as I said, you choose essentially a date timestamp by choosing an analysis. Um, and then that is uh, carried forward until you reset. So if you're working in uh, four week sprints, for example, in four weeks time, you would choose a new analysis here as the starting point for your next new code period. Uh, if you're using project versioning, um, a couple of uh, hints, I guess, um, you need to uh, be careful not to just always provide the same project uh, version number because you'll have an infinitely extending new code period. Um, likewise, you don't want to pass a build number to Sonicube because that way you'll have a very short new code period that's effectively uh, not useful. Um, obviously also don't randomly change the version and don't change the version if your code fails the quality gate. Uh, that's kind of twisting your way around the, the system because that will start a fresh new code period. And finally, um, quality gates are there to help you improve the quality of your code. They're not there as something to be gotten around if they turn red. Um, so the, the way Sony Cube is built, it's possible um, if you change your, if, you're, if you start a fresh new code period, um, if your quality gate criteria are all about new code, you can turn your quality gate from red back to green. Um, please don't do it. it. The quality gate is there for a reason. It's for you as an organization to improve and write better and cleaner code. Um, so don't manipulate the quality gate by manipulating the new code period. Okay, any questions before I move on to branch analysis? Uh, yeah, Melinda, I have a one question. Melind, hi. Yeah. Can, can we have a two, two new code period, right? So creating like one for, let's say for example, I have a multiple teams working on the same code repository, same uh, release, and I just wanted to do dashboard for one for the period, I can set up by period and one can I set up by some other uh, rules. Good, good question. You, you can't on the same branch 
but if they're working on two different branches, um, then yes, you can. Uh, so new code periods are essentially branch specific. Let me try and find yeah, yeah. an so example. They are working on the same branch, right? So maybe they are working on the same file also, but there are two, two teams. Like say consider it's a monolith, you know, we, they are working on the same uh, the same JS or some uh, file, right? Java file. Uh, but I just wanted to see that, you know, two dashboards, right? Uh, one for the one team A, uh, another for team B. Uh, but the new code will be, you know, from one, one will be the, uh, from the project version and another will be some time period, right? Uh, it can't possible, like we can have multiple tabs over here. Um, no, it's not possible. I'm, I'm not entirely sure why you would have two new code periods for two different teams working on the same piece of code. Uh, like say, for example, uh, the one new code is that, okay, I wanted to know a review uh, a three months period of time, right? And then mm -hmm. another would be like, you no, know, for team A, I will create one, one, uh, one more new period for uh, just uh, their sprint version and one uh, for some other sprint version from the same branch, right? I just wanted to have like two dashboard, like new dashboard for the same. Yeah, on the same branch is not possible, okay. unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, you're showing something. Um, yeah, I was just going to show that on different branches, it's, it's possible. So for example, uh, our, um, our Sony Cube 8.9 maintenance branch has its own new code period, and that's different from what went on with the 8.8 the .8 release, for example. So um, if they're working on different branches, it's definitely possible to have different new code periods. Um, if they're working on the same branch, it's, it's one per branch. Yeah. So uh, the another scenario, like no same. I we our, our team is working on the same repository, same branch, right? Say for example, release branch. So I wanted to have one uh, dimension, right, of new code for entire release, and another for no for every sprint. I wanted to see like uh, sprint wise if I can I could create the, the new code, so I can compare it. And do we have say, anything like no? Can we compare the multiple uh, new code? Uh, like say for example, I have a, a new code one, new code two. Say for example, these are project versions. Uh, can I have a, some comparative uh, uh, reporting? Like, can I see that report? Um, again, not if they're on the same, not if they're using the same branch. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm I'm changing the version, right? Version one, version two, version three, right? Every time. Yeah. It, 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 eventually, it will go into overall code. But if I wanted to have a, some like, dashboard or comparatively, like right? uh, in project in number one, project number one, I had a, a this many vulnerability, and in project two or maybe version two, I had uh, I improved uh, maybe some some ratio or some percentage of uh, security hotspot. Can I compare over these versions? Uh, you can, um, because we track all of the um, we track all of the metrics in the database. Okay. So all each metric calculated for a branch has history, and that history is tracked in the database. We do some cleanup um, further back in time to make sure we don't have a, a huge database. Um, but for recent history, it's available at a quite granular level. Um, so you you can look at um, issues. You can look at coverage metrics over time. You can look at duplications, or in fact, you can pull almost any metric out of the Sony Cube database uh, and look at its ev evolution across the lifespan of the project. Um, yeah. And you should be able to see version numbers here. I think um, we keep track of, so here, for example, here's our, our build string. We keep track of um, version number changes. Is yeah, that what you were after? This, this, yeah, yeah. This is overall, right? Start date, end date, and you know, we can uh, we can have a, this track of uh, uh, the issues. But I just wanted to compare project one, project two, right? Project three with project one uh, when I maintaining by project versions. All you you can't do that directly. You would have to pull that out of the web APIs. Okay. Assuming so. Are you assuming that project one has a different version number from project two? No, no, I have a same project. And then uh, say I, I set up a new code with project version one, right? Then eventually when I change this project version two, it will go into overall code, right? Yes. 
uh, now project 2 will start uh, project 2 will start then uh, project 3 will start eventually then i just wanted to backtrack like uh, what was uh, in project 1 like how many issues were there and i wanted to compare with the current project version say for example this project version could be my sprint version say for example yeah um look you you can using the web apis you would pull out um you'd probably do it based on date rather than version um so if you knew what date project one finished you will be able to query the web api and say okay tell me the total number of issues uh, total number of bugs for example uh, right. at the end of version one and the total number of bugs at the end of version two and then you can compare those two numbers okay so i could i could do this through the api call right yeah and you can see it indirectly here so for example code smells um, let's imagine that um, project one finished on the 9th of october at this point, I had 6,800 code smells. Um, and if project two ended on the 26th of March, then I have 5,780. So you can see some of that data interactively in the screen as well. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Thanks. No problem, happy Milind. Nope. Okay, let's move on to branch analysis and pull request analysis. Um, I've spoken about these, uh, I spoke about them yesterday briefly, and I've, I've got some, uh, some examples to show. You need to make some decisions based on your internal development process, whether you want to analyze um, branches, and or pull requests. There are pros and cons to both. Um, nothing, of course, comes for free. Every, every one of these analyses needs some, some time spent in the analysis. Um, there are some, some reasons to use branch analysis, particularly if you're using release branches. Um, it's less clear if you're using feature branches, whether you would analyze the branch or just analyze the pull request. Um, if you analyze uh, branches, you can focus on the issues that are created within each branch. So let's imagine that you're using uh, feature branches, for example. Your feature development cycle is quite long. Maybe it's uh, six weeks or eight weeks. And during that time, you want to get a, a warning ahead of time of whether this branch is going to meet the code quality standards of the organization when you finally decide to merge it. In that case, you would probably want to analyze your feature branch. If you have a really, really short development cycle, let's say your feature cycle is a week or two, um, then probably analyzing the feature branch itself is overkill. You're much better to analyze the pull request and just get instant feedback on the pull request. Um, it's a, a decision that teams will need to take depending on the individual circumstance of the project. Um, and again, if you're, if you're using release branches, you'll probably want to analyze them uh, with a new code period of their own. Um, Sonicube does some uh, copying of issue metadata across branches to make sure that, for example, if you mark something as a false positive in one branch, um, that's carried through to dependent branches or to branches that that branch merges into. Um, so it's it's really an individual balance perspective for each project to decide whether you want to use branch analysis. Um, there is some branch specific configuration uh, and some PR specific configuration, but as I mentioned earlier, that's taken care of in Jenkins for you um, by the multi-branch plugin, passing all of this information to, uh, to Sonicube. What I do want to do, though, is point out pull request analysis. Um, I mentioned this yesterday and earlier, but I want to show you a, a quick example, and I'll, I'll kind of step you through what I've done. Over in uh, Bitbucket, I created myself a feature branch, um, this March demo branch here, uh, a couple of days ago, and I've added uh, deliberately added a bug and a code smell into it. What I then did is I created a pull request and you saw my pipeline in Jenkins earlier. Um, it basically uh, using the multi-branch pipeline, I've 
asked Jenkins to analyze this pull request. So this pull request, uh, number 32 here, has basically got a deliberate bug and a deliberate smell. When that pull request analysis runs in Jenkins, it pushes the uh, information through to Bitbucket. And in my branch drop down at the top here, I now have an analysis of this pull request. All of the changes in change lines of code and added lines of code in the pull request are considered to be new code. And what Cernicube does when it analyzes a pull request is it analyzes the full project and then scopes the results down to just the change lines of code. Now, if you remember when we were looking back at the quality gate, um, the quality gate contains mostly uh, conditions on new code, and those are what's applied to a pull request analysis. And you can see here my pull request analysis has failed because I have a new bug. So my reliability rating is worse than A. Um, I also haven't added any coverage onto the new lines of code that I've added to my project. From Sonicube, I can dive in and see exactly what this new bug is. Um, it's my favorite bug of uh, adding a, a loop that runs backwards. Um, so I immediately, as the developer of this code, have information about what I should change um, to make sure this code will, will actually pass the quality gate. Now, if I was using Sonalint here, I would also have been um, reminded of this inside my IDE. But for the purpose of demonstration, um, let's assume it escaped my notice in Sonalint and it's actually now um, in Sonacube. So I have a warning about what's really going on. Um, what I also have is that this information has been pushed out onto the PR itself. So Sonalint has decorated, sorry, Sonacube has decorated the pull request with information about the issues. And if I'm lucky, yes. So here on the right-hand side in Bitbucket, you can see that there's a red exclamation mark next to my Sonacube analysis. And if I pop up this box, I can see that I have my bug and I have my code smell. And in fact, what we can do in Bitbucket is mark these up in line. So even in Bitbucket, um, I can see this bug in context and decide uh, if I'm the peer reviewer of this code, how I should give feedback to my developer friend who's been, um, who's been writing their loops backwards. So whether you're the developer looking at Sonicube or the peer reviewer looking at the PR inside Bitbucket, you have all of the Sonicube quality and security information to understand what's going on with the code and decide in a sensible way whether you can merge this. If I did go ahead and merge this, the next time the scan for my main branch ran, these three lines here would be considered new code. And again, my quality gate on my main branch would trigger and turn red because I've just introduced a new bug or a bug in my new code period. So this is really the um, Sonar Lint and pull request analysis are the early warning mechanisms for your new code before you do a merge onto the main branch. Um, we also supply this mechanism in GitLab uh, and all of the other major ALMs. Um, depending on the capability that the ALM provides us, some of them we don't um, actually mark up line by line, um, but in Bitbucket we definitely do. Any questions about PRs? So while running, uh, while running this, uh, 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 how to set up this uh, PR, uh, uh, like the dimension of uh, PR, right? Every PR I need to mention in the Jenkins job or it will be just uh, setting up like I wanted up all PRs uh, to be analyzed. Um, if you're using the multi-branch pipeline plugin for Jenkins, right. um, then it is all automatic. Okay, I need to set to something, right? As a sonar option. Uh, yes, you need to set up um, the Sonicube plugin and the multi-branch plugin. 
and then you simply um, tell Jenkins to discover branches okay. and to discover pull requests. Okay, I need not to mention the each pull request or maybe a kind of a date version, right? All requests, all pull requests will be now analyzed. Yes. And there is a property somewhere that tells Jenkins not to analyze a branch if it also has a pull request. And I can't remember where I've added it. Why I'm asking this question, right? Say, for example, like, you, okay, go what you want to say first. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to see that all, all peers, and then I just wanted to see that all peers which are already merged, uh, like, uh, and not merged. Can we have that uh, only merged PRs to be analyzed? With why would you analyze? Why would you analyze a merged PR? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. As you, as as a as a quality gate, I should not accept uh, that uh, PR. Uh, if I have. But say for example, you no, know, I I have some lenient rules, and I just wanted to see all the PRs, merged PRs, or maybe or PRs raised. I want to analyze. And if, if you if if you've merged a PR, then it's the code is on the branch. Okay. And right. analyzing the branch will suffice. What, oh. what you what you want to do is analyze a PR before it gets merged. So you have a warning, you can make a decision whether you merge it or not. Right. That's our goal, right? Yes. Hey, you're showing something like no PR? No, I'm, I'm done. Okay. So this, this pipeline will now uh, analyze all PRs, all open PRs uh, and push them through into Sonicube. So every PR that's created um, will have a Sonicube analysis um, run on it. Right. Yeah, thanks. Milind, Milind, have I answered your question? Yeah, yeah, you answered your question. I just, I'm okay. just thinking okay. Perfect. Anyone else? Nope. Okay. Um, let's move on to talking about code security. Um, I know this is a, an important topic and I have uh, both a couple of slides and a couple of demos to uh, look at the different types of issues that SonyCube creates around security. I spoke about these in principle yesterday. Um, so vulnerabilities and security hotspots. Today, I'd like to give you a couple of examples of how they work uh, and how you can um, use the workflows within SonyCube to find them and, and deal with them. So just a quick refresher. We spoke about vulnerabilities where the call to action is to fix the problem. And we spoke about security hotspots where the call to action is to, for, for somebody in the team who has the context of the project to review the hotspot and decide whether it's safe. Uh, so what I want to do now is step through each of those and I'm going to just grab a quick example of a nice vulnerability. Let's take a SQL injection one. Okay, um, the Sony Cube security engine that analyzes injection vulnerabilities uses a technique called taint analysis. And the way it works is Sony Cube knows endpoints in your code where data from the external world, so data that can be controlled by an end user, can enter the code. That data is potentially malicious. Anything that comes from the outside world, from a web form or from a file, um, is potentially malicious data if it's controllable by an end user. And so that data is considered to be tainted. SonyCube then tracks that data across multiple files, multiple function calls, um, through to the point where that data is used for a security sensitive operation like a SQL query or creating a file or, or creating a directory. At that point, if you haven't sanitized that data using a known sanitization function to remove malicious characters, SonyCube will consider that you have an injection vulnerability and it will create an issue 
on the line where you um, use that data for a sensitive operation. Now, that's useful. You know where you're um, using data to do something bad, but what you really need is, as a developer is to know, okay, how did we get here? How did that data enter the control flow of my code? And what path did it take? Because we've used that data to derive the fact that you have the injection vulnerability at all, um, Sony Cube can actually present that. So these numbers you see here alongside the code are Sony Cube's annotation of the steps that that data has taken to get to where we are now. And in fact, in the navigation pane on the left, we provide this all the way back through to where the data entered your code. So here's where the issue has been raised at number 16. Um, we can track that data back across multiple files and multiple function calls all the way to the point where, um, in this case, for example, we've parsed an external file. And so you now have the information at your fingertips as a developer to say, okay, I know where this data entered, the control flow of my code. I know where it's used. I can now take a look at the flow of that data and decide what the best point is to sanitize it, to remove um, uh, potentially uh, malicious characters from that external data. This um, data flow technique and the, the way of presenting this in Sony Cube is available across all of our injection vulnerabilities. It's also available when you import those vulnerabilities into Sony Lint. And it's used for a couple of other rules in Sony Cube as well. So, uh, for example, our Java null pointer detection mechanism uh, has this data flow uh, tracking to show you how you've arrived at the point of potentially dereferencing a null pointer. Um, so it's predominantly used for vulnerabilities, um, but also for a couple of other rules in Sony Cube. So if you see in your Sony Cube code viewer one of these numbers attached, then you've got some navigation that you can use on the left side to help you understand the flow of um, this vulnerability. And uh, I happen to have chose one with, chosen one with multiple flows. There are other flows through the code that um, invoke the same vulnerability on the same line. So Sony Cube lets you navigate through these sets, different sets of um, data flows if there are more than one. Security hotspots, let me just double check. Um, yep, this will do. Um, security hotspots have quite a different workflow. Um, as I mentioned, the, the call to action here is for someone to review the code rather than fixing. So what Sony Q presents you is not so much um, the, the issue itself as um, the snippet of code and some context around potential risk. Because your decision here is, is this code already safe? Am I okay with this code? Or should I ask somebody to fix it? And so there's an entire workflow in Sony Cube um, where Sony Cube presents the security hotspots in uh, priority order. Um, so priority high, medium, and low. And you work your way through um, each of the hotspots and disposition them to various members of the team. So here you can see we've got a hard-coded password hotspot. Um, I may decide, uh, in this case, I know that we've um, deliberately injected a, a, a baseline administrator password. So I could change the status of this code to safe, add a comment saying, yes, we know that we've done this for a particular reason. At this point, the hotspot will be closed and the team can get on with reviewing the rest of them. Or I can actually disposition this to a, a developer and say, hey, Cameron, um, we didn't really want to hard code passwords here. Let's uh, get rid of this or store it in a file or, or do something different. Um, can we please get, uh, can we please change this code? Um, and then the hotspot gets fixed uh, and is closed by Sony Cube on the next, uh, the next scan. So this workflow is permission controlled. If you need to uh, reserve the ability to, to mark hotspots uh, to, for example, architects or senior developers, you can do that using the permission system inside Sony Cube. 
So two workflows, one designed to allow you to uh, see the data flow through the code, the other designed to let you know um, what the risks are, whether you're potentially at risk and allow you to uh, disposition hotspots to developers if they need to be fixed or mark them as safe. A couple of other things to mention relating to security. Uh, in many organizations um, who have been working with projects for a long time, uh, it's possible that you've built up your own frameworks for things like database access, file access, um, rather than using uh, open, source, um, open source libraries. Now, you may be transitioning to open source libraries, but you have uh, some existing frameworks inside the organization. When we build the security engine at Sonosource, we can, or we do, um, uh, configure it with all of the well-known frameworks for each of the major languages we analyze. So Java, C Sharp, PHP, Python, JavaScript, and TypeScript. We know all of the major um, frameworks and how they manipulate data. So we know entry points for code, uh, for, sorry, for data into code. We know um, SQL uh, queries, we know commands to open files and so on. And we configure those into our analyzer. We obviously can't configure your proprietary frameworks. Uh, so what we do there is we give you in SonyCube Enterprise Edition, the ability to add uh, framework calls, framework function calls to the security engine so that SonyCube can um, better keep track of security issues in your custom frameworks. So you can add uh, sources, sanitizers, uh, functions that don't do anything, so pass-throughs and syncs, security sensitive functions that, that use the data that's in the code uh, for Java, PHP and Python from memory. And this is configurable inside SonyCube. Stepping up a little away from the technical aspects of security and more towards reporting, um, we have compliance reporting uh, in OWASP and CWE uh, frameworks. If you have a security team that needs to um, gather together all of the information about the security of a project in one place. So in Sony Cube Enterprise Edition, there's a security reporting tab for each project for each application and for each portfolio. And it gathers together all of the vulnerabilities and hotspots broken down by our own Sonos source categorization or OWASP or CWE. I think I mentioned yesterday, we're in the process of transitioning to this to the new OWASP 2021 categorization. Um, I expect that to come out in SonyCube 9.4 uh, in a few weeks time. And I think I already talked yesterday about the security languages that we support in 8.9 and the 9 series. Um, so I won't cover that again today. Um, a couple of suggestions around security best practices, um, making sure that you have the security rating in your quality gates, at least for new code and probably for overall code as well. Um, it's built into the default quality gates. So uh, it's, it's already there as a reminder. The introduction of security hotspots, particularly if you have them in your quality gate, um, will mean that you need a new step in your development cycle to make sure there's somebody available to review the hotspots in your code. Um, because if you've added the security hotspot review criteria to your quality gate, you won't be able to pass the quality gate until you've done that. Um, so making sure that you've got somebody who understands the workflow, has the right permission and can um, review those security hotspots is, becomes important. Let me pause here for questions or comments. Hi, Cameron. This is Nikhil here. <clears throat> Hi, Nikhil. Yeah. So I have a question. Uh, so generally, quality gate uh, we defined uh, as a uh, coverage, code coverage duplicate. Uh, lines, maintainability ratings, reliability ratings, security ratings, right? All the mm -hmm. features. Based on that, we define our quality gate, right? 
Correct. <clears throat> yeah, and all are having their standards. So uh, can I, I mean, uh, customize it uh, as per some my requirement, like uh, coverage 80%. So if I go with some uh, either increase or decrease, or can I set up uh, uh, some customization here? Uh, so, for example, you want code coverage to increase by five percent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, unfortunately, their their absolute number is not relative. Um, but the general best practice with Sony Cube is to um, keep code coverage high on new code, mm -hmm. uh, and use the new code coverage metric in your uh, in your quality gate. And the reason for that is that. Um, particularly projects that have a long history, sometimes code coverage wasn't important in the past. So you might have an overall code coverage of maybe 40%, um, but code coverage is important for teams right now. So yeah. if you have the new code coverage set to 85 or 80, um, you're not punishing the, the existing code, um, but you are holding your current developers to a high standard of, of coverage. Yes. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, there's Shoris uh, camera. Uh, so just uh, Hi, similar Shurish. to the right. so similar on the customization. Uh, so mostly as you are showing the number of rules that we are adding, right? And uh, rule has inheritance. So right now, what you are doing is, if I need to inherit a new rule, right? Um, how can I add more uh, customized rules uh, as per my need? Apart from what is the sonar cube to provide? Uh, is there any specific way to add them? Uh, no. What should be the you know approach that you suggest to adding your our own customized rules? Uh, perfectly reasonable question. Um, there are two uh, main paths to adding extra rules to Sonar Cube above the ones that we provide from Sonar Source. Um, Sonar Cube can import rules from external analyzers. So if you have um, other language linters or even your own static analysis tools and you want to kind of aggregate everything in Sonicube, it's possible to import external issues. Um, uh, they're basically imported as uh, an XML file. For some languages, it is possible to write completely custom rules. So Java, I think JavaScript, COBOL, uh, and a couple of others, it's possible to write essentially a custom plugin for Sony Cube that encap encapsulates your rules. Now, that's not a light undertaking. It's basically developing uh, a rule that hooks into the Sony Cube analyzer that understands uh, the syntax tree that we build up for a file and then applies your rules to it. Um, our documentation has some instructions on starting this, and there are some examples in our GitHub repo. Um, but uh, don't take it as a kind of a lightweight exercise to, you know, just throw bits of couple of bits of configuration together. You're actually developing a real custom rule, so it is possible for some languages. Um, the the other path is really to import rules from external analyzers and view them in Sonar Cube. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, so I will, you know, refer to the XML, you know, format. Um, we have done that previously. I just wanted to see if there is any other better approach apart from that. Thank yeah. you. Tim. Uh, let me just quickly uh, external issues. Uh, and here's the format. Um, So you can see here, sorry, it's not XML, it's um, uh, JSON. Uh, so you can see here the, the format that we, that we use for import, it's relatively straightforward. Um, so this is the primary mechanism for getting issues generated by tools that are not Sonicube uh, into Sonicube to be able to view them. Let me drop that into the chat so you have a reference. Okay, thank you. No problem. Other questions? 
No? Okay, we're almost at the end. We've got two sections to go uh, and 20 minutes. So let's, uh, let's keep going. The next section I want to talk about um, is issue management. And rather than using, you, you'll get this diagram in the slides, but rather than using this, I want to show you in real life how issues are administered. We have an issue workflow for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that uh, unfortunately, and despite the fact that our teams work really hard on them, um, occasionally in static code analysis, you get what's called a false positive. So Sonicube detects an issue, which is not really an issue. And as a team, particularly if that issue is turning your quality gate red, you need to have a mechanism to manage that. You need to be able to mark an issue as false positive and say to Sonicube, I've looked at the code. Um, sorry, Sonicube, you got it wrong. Um, and we need to mark this issue as false positive. There are a couple of other uh, ways to disposition issues that I want to mention. So let me grab one here in our demo platform and um, give you a sense of what you can do with an issue. Um, the first message is as a developer, absolutely the easiest way to close an issue in Sonicube is simply to fix the code have a look at the issue, take a look at the Sonicube documentation, say, ah, okay, I understand why Sonicube has raised that. Here's what I need to do, fix the issue, commit it on the next scan, Sonicube will automatically close the issue for you. And you don't actually need to do anything inside the Sonicube UI. So easiest way, fix the issue. Other options, um, if you want to do some signaling inside the team that says, hey, we're not there yet, but I've taken a look at this issue and yes, we definitely need to fix that. I'm doing it in a, a hardening sprint in a week's time. Um, you can use this confirm status. And basically that says to your team, I know it's an issue, I've taken a look at it and, and yes, we're going to do something about it. If you have already fixed the issue and it's simply waiting for a branch to be merged or waiting for the next scan to be done, you can close an issue in Sonicube and mark it as fixed. There's no cheating here though. If Sonicube discovers that you've marked an issue as fixed but haven't actually fixed the code on the next scan, um, Sonicube will reopen this issue in a special reopen status um, and it will reappear on the line where you've marked it as fixed. So this is fairly rarely used because generally it's, it's just easier to fix the code, um, but it is there if you need it. The final two resolutions um, are basically to mark something as a false positive, which is the situation I was talking about earlier. And this says, okay, Sonicube, the analyzer got it wrong. This issue needs to be closed. Sonicube will never reopen that issue on the same line. Um, it will always be known as a false positive for that line of code. Um, and basically it's then closed as far as Sonicube is concerned. Um, if this issue is the one that was keeping the quality gate red, immediately the quality gate will be recalculated and it will turn green. Uh, and you can then get on with, um, with the rest of your, your work. And finally, there's a resolution as won't fix. This is kind of the inverse of false positive. It basically says, yes, Sonicube, the analysis was correct. This is an issue. Um, but as a team, for whatever reason, we've decided that we're not going to fix it. It maybe doesn't make sense in, in the context of the project or um, it's not worth the effort that we will go to to fix it. So we don't want it interfering with the rest of the analysis and our issue counts. We're actually going to close it. And the same deal, um, if this was holding the quality gate red, um, then the quality gate will turn green as soon as you resolve it as won't fix. Um, the problem is never opened on that same line of code. Um, and for fairly obvious reasons, these are quite dangerous. So um, you can imagine the pressure of the day before the release, uh, project manager is running around, tearing their hair out. The team has one blocker bug um, that is holding the quality gate red. Uh, it's really tempting to say, look, we'll mark it as false positive. We'll come back to it after the release and fix it in a, in a patch. So you resolve the issue as false positive. The quality gate turns green. You ship the code. What you've just done is you've shipped code with a blocker bug because resolving as false positive doesn't change the code at all. It simply closes the issue in Cernicube. 
Um, so be really careful using these. They do have legitimate purposes um, and they are ver uh, permission controlled uh, so that you can control who has access to these. Um, but even if you have the power to use them, be very careful about how you do it because it's very easy to sweep your, sweep your problems under the carpet. So that's the issue life cycle. Uh, and I've already spoken about multiple issue locations. Uh, this is our mechanism for highlighting data flow in vulnerability uh, rules and allowing you to understand how data has flown, flowed through your code. So the last major topic for today, before I wrap up with a couple of um, key points, is about Sonalint. So I gave you a demo of Sonalint yesterday. This is all about shifting analysis as close to you as developers as we possibly can. You spend a lot of time inside your IDE. The earlier we can warn you about um, crappy code, then the less crappy code you're going to write. Uh, and you saw from my example yesterday, it's really easy when you're writing code in a hurry to make uh, mistakes. And Sonalint is there to pick up the pieces and say, hey, Cameron, that was a really terrible um, line you just wrote. You should do something about it before it gets anywhere near Bitbucket and a pull request analysis. So the key features that Sonalint provides you um, within the five major IDEs, uh, Eclipse, IntelliJ, Visual Studio, VS Code, and CLion, um, plus variants on those. So most of the rest of the, uh, the IntelliJ family of uh, language specific IDEs are in, uh, supported along with a couple of Eclipse variants like CDT, um, IDZ and RDZ for uh, mainframe development. The idea is that it's on the fly analysis as you're typing. Generally, you'll be working one file at a time uh, and Sonalint will only run on one file at a time to keep things snappy and fast. Um, there is a mode for analyzing all projects in a file, but do be a little careful with it. If you have a huge project, um, it, can, it can take some time and slow down your IDE. And I mentioned that we have connected mode. The idea here is um, probably three key features. Uh, and a couple of uh, added bonuses. Uh, the second bullet point here, when you're in connected mode with Sonar Lint, your quality profile that's applied in your IDE will be aligned with what is in Sonar Cube. So if you've done what our development teams did when I showed you earlier and added a hundred rules to the baseline quality profile, Sonar Lint will also apply those rules. So you get equivalence of uh, issues in Sonar Lint and Sonar Cube to about 90 or 95%. Um, the second really useful feature of Sonalink connected mode, if you've marked something as false positive or won't fix in Sona cube, that will be reflected in Sonalint to reduce some noise in your IDE. And finally, you have the ability to open hotspots and pull across um, taint vulnerabilities into Sonalint in connected mode. Uh, we're doing some work on this at the moment. At the moment, it's um, uh, probably iteration two of this feature. So from Sona Cube, you can ask to open a hotspot in Sona Lint. Uh, from Sona Lint, you can pull across the taint vulnerabilities. Um, we're looking to evolve this to make it a little more real time, and maybe we run um, hotspot rules inside Sona Lint as well. So there'll be a bit of evolution in this space. Um, across the next, uh, the rest of 2022. Uh, and finally, um, each, uh, is this the next slide? No, um, each uh, IDE has essentially a couple of core languages that we analyze out of the box with the version of Sonalint that plugs in directly. If you're in connected mode, generally we add a couple of extra languages, usually our commercial languages, um, to allow you to analyze those inside Sonalint or inside your IDE as well. So for example, in uh, Eclipse, you can add COBOL analysis to your IDE um, by using connected mode. Uh, so a quick feature overview on the fly analysis, which I showed you yesterday, um, issues are highlighted in line, 
uh, and you have all of the rule documentation that you expect in Cernicube also available to you in Cernalint. Uh, to enable connected mode, the experience varies slightly per IDE. This is a set of screenshots from, I think, BS Code. Um, you bind your Cernalint instance to your Cernicube server as a general binding, and then you uh, select the project that you're editing. So you use the Cernicube project key to bind the current set of edited files to a Cernicube project. And at that point, you have quality profile alignment. Uh, and you get some uh, nice in-app notifications if, for example, the status of your quality gate changes. Uh, one thing that's not mentioned here, but is coming gradually to Cernalint as well, is branch awareness. Uh, so up until recently, Cernalint was not branch aware. Um, it would simply apply the rules to whichever um, uh, branch you are on. We're starting to slowly build this out. So if you've marked something as a false positive on a branch, and in Cernalint, you're working on the same branch, um, Cernalint will start suppressing those issues as well. So there's a little bit of work to go there, um, but making Cernalint more branch aware is starting to become, uh, is rolling out across the different IDEs uh, over the coming months. And that's about it on Cernalint. I know there have been a couple of questions as we've been going through. So I want to pause there to make sure that everyone has time to ask further questions about Cernalint. Ah, so good question from um, Sumiyit. Uh, it's reasonably common practice to keep commented out code uh, in, your, um, in your code for when you need it in the future. There is a Sonicube code smell for commented out code. Couple of choices. Um, you can either take that out of your quality profile uh, if you don't think that rule is, or if this is a really common practice in the organization, take that rule out of the quality profile completely. Um, you can also, uh, you should also be able to suppress individual instances of, of this inside Sona Lint, I think. Um, if it's a really common uh, practice in the organization, I'd probably suggest taking it out of the quality profile. Any other questions on Sona Lint? Uh, Cameron, uh, uh, can you just go to the previous slide? Uh, yeah, so at the right side corner, um, uh, I can say manage advanced configuration. So in Sonar mm -hmm. Lint, uh, can we do some additional configuration apart from uh, Sonar Cube? Um, it's not additional configuration, but it's equivalent configuration. So let me okay. um, just give you a quick, uh, no, actually this is not, let me use IntelliJ because it's, it's a nicer, um, it's a nicer UI. Uh, for example, you can configure some exclusions inside Sonalint. So some of the same configuration that you can do with Sonacube, uh, you can also do in Sonalint. Okay. Now let's take a look here when this arrives. Okay. Uh, so analysis properties here, you can basically set, so if I wanted to set Sona.exclusions here, uh, okay. if I can spell, um, I can set these analysis properties here inside um, Sona Lint. Uh, in fact, there's there's already a separate section for file exclusions if you want to apply um, file exclusions inside Sonalint. And you can see here's my binding to my Sonicube LTS version. Um, and uh, I've got a project that's uh, analyzed on my local Sonicube instance. Sorry, this is an IntelliJ screenshot, not a uh, VS Code. VS Code's uh, configuration is a little nastier because it's all based in configuration files. 
-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So much. No problem. Yeah. All right. That is um, the main content for today. I have about three or four wrap up slides, which will take the final three or four minutes, but I do want to pause quickly for any general questions. We've covered a lot of ground today, I'm really aware. Um, and I should mention, I'm happy to take uh, follow up questions after these training sessions, if there's anything about the training content, um, maybe if we can funnel those via uh, Priya or Prashanth, um, I'm happy to take questions offline. Um, all of our documentation is available both online and in Sonicube. Um, but let me open the floor now for, for general questions about anything we've covered today. Uh, Cameron? Hi, Laxman. Hi. Uh, I don't know if uh, this is the similar question that Milin has asked or not, uh, but can we uh, have different projects set up for uh, two different brands? Like, let's say I have a project and uh, some development is going on one of the branch in Bitbucket and other development is going on, let's say, feature uh, branch. So can I have both these branches configured in SonarCube and uh, get the reports for both? Uh, you can. Generally, they're grouped under the same project. So you use the same project key and a different branch analysis. Let me give you an example here. Um, so for example, in SonarCube, we uh, analyze all of our version release branches. So you can see here, we've got a branch for 8.8. .8. This has its own uh, mm -hmm. overall code and new code period. We have another branch for 8.9. This is our long-term support version. So it's got already some bug fix um, pull requests available. It also has its own new code and overall code period. So yes, it's, it's possible. And you can have as many branches as you like. Um, there's no limit per project. So what's the default branch? Uh, the, default, the default branch is master or main, depending on how your uh, CI system is set up. Uh, sorry, your SCM system is set up. Um, when you import a project into SonarCube using the import tool, uh, it will align with whatever is set up in your, uh, in your SCM. OK, got that. Uh, Milind here. So, do, do we have any notification system? Say, for example, like you no know, Sonar had uh, already uh, uh, given that this is a this is an issue. But we are, if we are ac accepting, we are changing the status. Right? This is not issue. Consider this is uh, not an issue. So, do we have any notification to you no know, project lead, project management? I wanted to say. And another thing, like, to, do we have something like uh, you no know, uh, all that we have accepted as a not a defect? Right? Do we have some reporting? Uh, we can do some analysis on that report. Uh, sorry, what was the second question, Milind? Yeah, yeah. do we have anything like, no, do we get those information, like all that request, uh, all those issues we accepted as an order defect, right? Uh, manually, we change the status. And so can we have a one report or, or we can do the further analysis on some other, you know, okay. in future, right? So um, any reporting or any notification or what are the notification system or metrics we can assign, uh, create and configured yeah there are notifications um so per project uh let me just grab one per project i can set uh, email notifications for um changes in issues that are assigned to me uh quality gate changes issues that are resolved as false positive or won't fix um, new issues or my new issues these are all done by email um, for audit reporting uh each issue keeps track of its own history uh, and so you can see who changed the status of a particular issue uh, at any point in its time uh, let me just go back to my project again let's take a look at one of these issues uh, if you click on this little um, drop down here it's not entirely obvious this holds the issue history um, so if I was to change one of these to 
uh, let's change it to uh, resolve as false positive. Um, this will now say, okay, this has been changed to a false positive and, and resolved. Um, so that's all tracked inside the issue itself. Um, if you need to pull that out for reporting, again, the web APIs are probably your best uh, okay. choice. Yeah, yeah. So, so I agree. Like uh, it's good, right? We can see it over here. But yeah, just I wanted to know any events are trigger or we can know we can write some code in that event somewhere. So yeah, uh, through API we are, we can do that, right? Yeah. Yeah, something which I wanted like now immediately need to be trigger or somebody like uh, if I wanted to send one notification to any project so, management team. So yeah. so project managers can sign themselves up for notifications for things like false positives and won't fix. Um, it, it's self sign up. Uh, so you saw when in my account earlier um, under notifications, I can add a particular project and then get notifications for that project. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just take a couple of minutes. We're going to go slightly over time, um, but I want to take a couple of minutes to give a couple of key uh, final takeaway messages. Hopefully none of these will come as a surprise because I've been uh, hammering most of these messages all the way through uh, these last two sessions. Um, but here's a wrap up of what we've covered. Code quality and code security is a continuous process. Um, analyzing the main branches of your project on a regular basis means that you have trend information as well as point in time information. And really that's important to understand if your project and your project teams are moving in the right direction. So I really encourage you to make sure you're automating as much of this as possible in Jenkins and running regular code scans, particularly on those main branches. We've spoken a lot about focusing on new code. Uh, and again, I want to re-emphasize this. It's the only practical way to manage large projects and projects with a lot of history. It's built into Sonicube and there are plenty of tools to, um, plenty of mechanisms built in to help you manage your new code. So I really encourage you to um, focus on new code, set your quality gates up around it, set your development processes up around it, um, and uh, let Sonicube help you manage those projects. Uh, and Sonicube and its ecosystem and its feature set, uh, including Sonalint, are all there to help you shift code quality and security as far left, as far towards you as possible. So we've spoken a lot about pull request analysis. It's an essential part of that, making sure that you have information early before you merge requests, um, before you merge pull requests. And in Sonalint, making sure that your typos and your, um, your mistakes uh, don't get even anywhere near Bitbucket, let alone into a pull request. So I'd really encourage you, uh, Sonalint is a completely free download plugin for your, your IDE. Experiment with it, align it with Sonicube as you get more confident. Um, and then you'll have as, as much early warning as we can possibly give you uh, about um, issues inside your code. And finally, quality gates are your governance mechanism. They're your choice on what is important for you as an organization. Uh, so I would really encourage you to think carefully about them. And once you've done that, stick to them. They're there for a reason. Uh, if the quality gate is red, as a team, you go and fix the issue that's holding the quality gate red and move it back to green. So um, they're a really fundamental part of Sonicube helping you enforce code quality and write better code and safer code across the organization. Uh, finally, uh, as an organization, you can decide to uh, do this on a, a periodic basis and, and gradually um, raise the bar across the organization by periodically reviewing your gates and, and maybe your profiles if you're using the most recent version to make sure that you're keeping up with new rules um, that we provide at Sonosource 
and that you're um, ratcheting up code quality and security across the organization. So on a final note, um, Priya has just dropped a uh, feedback form. Uh, I imagine that's an internal feedback form. Uh, let me also, if you don't mind, quickly drop in a URL for you. If you have a chance to fill in our feedback form at Sonosource, this helps us um, uh, improve this training uh, with uh, things that you would like to see more of and things that you would like to see less of. So if you have a chance, please, I'd really appreciate um, your feedback. I'd like to also thank you all very much. It's been a big time investment from you yesterday and today. Um, you've asked heaps of really useful and important questions, uh, and I hope I've been able to answer all of them. As I mentioned earlier, um, I'm more than happy if there are some follow-up questions on the training material to um, handle those offline. So thank you all very much. I'm going to stop the recording here. Thank you so much, Cameron. Thank you so much for the